Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the gift of today. We thank you, Almighty God, that the entrance of your word gives light and understanding to the simple. I thank you, Almighty God, that the message that you have given me in this morning, we change lives, we impart lives in the name of Jesus Christ. It will cause transformation to every one of us. Thank you, Almighty God. Lord, thank you for giving us a message that will reprogram our lives to be able to take advantage of everything that Christ has done for us. Help us to look at these little foxes, little foxes of thought processes in our hearts that rob us of the victory that we have in Jesus. We thank you, Almighty God, that your name will be glorified and your people will be edified. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen, amen. Praise God. Now, I bring you a message, which is part two of the message that I preached last week, titled, How to Develop an Ownership Mindset, or you might paraphrase it as, All Things Are Yours, part two. We look at the scripture. Where we stopped last week was in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. The Bible says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, remember in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, the Bible says, through faith, we understand that the words were framed by the word of God. And I said, what that means is that everything in the universe can be framed by the word of God. The word framed is what katatizo, which means to set in place. And I spoke about the fact that a mindset is literally a set mind. And that set mind is set because of words spoken over that mind over a period of time that the mind has no challenge or rebuted. And such as it were, the mind gets molded into the image of the words spoken into it. And I think that explanation is absolutely important not to lose sight of it, that your mind will be set to the image of what you expose your mind to repeatedly. You become, you have a mindset that is attuned or molded to the shape of what your mind is exposed to regularly. So you were not born with the mind that you are, with the mindset that you have now. You were, you were not born with it. It's a mindset that is developed over time because that mind was exposed, right, to conditions, to words, to pictures, right, that have gone unchallenged, that have therefore molded the mind to see life in a particular way. Paradigms are nothing more than the way we view life. But we view life based on three things. The verbal programming of the past, how the things we heard when we were growing up, the modeling, the people that are in place of authority in our lives when we we're growing up, and how they behave, and we copy their behavior. And number three, events that have happened in our lives, right, that we have appended meaning to, and it has become the way we see our lives. So somebody might be here today and said, I am always angry. I'm an angry person. That's the way I that's the way I am. I, I, I am. My father is like the same thing like that. My mother is the same thing like that. Anger runs in the family. I hate to bust the bubble to you that you were not born with anger in your DNA. You anger is a function of unresolved issues in your mind that you have left there, left to fester. And therefore become, has become um, a fire that lights up just like that when something happens. The anger issue is not something that you were born with. Everything in, that you see in your life today is a function of attitude that you picked up as you were growing up. Everybody is born with a blank slate. Please try to understand what I'm saying. I know there are genetical issues, right? Maybe DNA construct and all that. So this is the, this runs in the DNA. But let me tell you something. Attitude, attitude, it's not a function of DNA. Attitude is a function of the things that you have exposed yourself to, that you have believed as that is who you are. And therefore, you behave because that's the way you've always seen yourself. Because every child born into the world is born with a blank mind. 
we pull information from the outward environment and because we didn't have the ability to filter what we hear and what we see and what we process we just took everything as it were when we're young and we said that's the way we are and if we don't challenge our thought process challenge what we believe we will always produce what our parents have produced so i i preached a message about two three weeks ago that i mentioned about the anatomy of a cause and the fact that believers are not under a cause. You can go back and watch it, watch it. And I explain this three programming that programs the human mind, right? So that we, we begin to see ourselves based on these things, but they are not true. The fact that you have this proclivity to be angry or to behave anyhow doesn't mean you cannot change. As a matter of fact, the day you became born again, God implanted implanted in you a new dna a structure a new being you are a new being that never existed before therefore your behavior should pattern after the reality of the new creation now the bible says something about this in the book of ephesians the bible says that that we should put off i think i think creation we should put off the old man and put on the new man which means you put off and you put on. Essentially, what that means is you must realize that you are no longer an angry person. That the person who used to be angry died when Christ became when Christ came into your life when you became born again. But now all that is left now is the residual programming of your mind that is still making you feel or think like you're an angry person. And therefore, what you have to do is to replace the image of anger with the image of somebody who has a sound mind now in Christ. And how do you do that? You do that through what the Bible calls the renewing of the mind. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12 that we are transformed only as we renew our minds, which means our life changes, right? As we allow our mind to be renewed, the mind is the center point between the spirit and the body. And therefore, the mind determines the experience you get in life. So, it is the way you program your mind that will determine whether you are going to enjoy the benefit of salvation or not. So, when we talk about a mindset, we're talking about a, a mind that is set or a set mind based on the programming that that mind is exposed to. So, you want to have an ownership mindset, you must expose your mind to messages that teach about ownership mindset, that teach about your identity in Christ, that teach about who you are in Christ, that teach about the way God sees you now. The Bible makes us to understand that you are a joint heir with Christ. What does the word joint heir means? The word joint heir means that you co-own everything that Christ owns. Whatever Christ owns, you own with him. He has made you a partaker of that inheritance. Praise be to God. The Bible says, God has made us, this was Christ, who has made us to be partakers of the inheritance in the saints. God has made us, it is God himself who has made us partakers, sharer of the inheritance in the saints. So whatever inheritance that Christ, God, from God the Father, by virtue of his death, burial, and resurrection, and ascension, you are a partaker of that. Please start understand that. There's nothing that Christ has achieved that he did not achieve for your sake. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 3, the Bible essentially says, the exceeding greatness of God's power is unto us, word, which is all of the power that God demonstrated in raising Christ from the dead. It was done for our benefit. The exceeding greatness of God's power is unto us, word. So, so <laughs> raising Lazarus from the dead, healing blind mind, healing blind Bathemias, and all the things that Christ did, he did it for the benefit of the church. Who is the church? Church, you are the church. These things were done for your benefit. So the reason why I'm laboring this is I want you to understand that you don't have the short end of the stick in life. I want you to have this understanding that you don't have the short end of the stick in life. If you have been told or been programmed and be told over, over and over and over and over again that the reason why, that why nothing is moving in your life is because of the sins of your parents or because of X, Y, and Z in your life, I'm here to tell you that that is all bunkum, that they have told you a lie. If you have ever given your life to Jesus, you started again on a clean slate. Now, if you started on a clean slate, 
It's absolutely important to understand what God has written on that slate. The new slate of your life, you must understand what God has written on it. Because when you understand what God has written on it, and you then begin to act like God said you should act, begin to speak like God said you should speak, begin to believe like God said you should believe, then you are going to get the result that God said you are going to get. So we ended last week with Romans chapter 10 verse 17 when the Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing the word of God, which means your faith will grow to the extent of what you keep hearing and hearing. What is that thing that you're hearing? The word of God. Now, remember in Hebrews 11, 3, it says, Through faith we believe that the words were framed by the word of God, which means everything in the universe can be framed. Everything in the universe is framed by the word. You can frame your own mind. You can set your own mind. You can have a mindset framed by the word of God. So, when we talk about an ownership mindset, today I want to finish the part two of the message I preached last week about how do you then develop this ownership mindset? How do you develop an ownership mindset? To be able to explain that, I want to go back to the text we covered last week. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In the NLT it says, faith comes from hearing and that is hearing the good news about Christ. So your faith can only come, faith can only come to you based on hearing the good news, not the bad news. And this is profound because if you hear the bad news, fear will come. If you hear the good news, faith will come. Whichever, whichever one you, has, you have heard, whether good or bad, will create after their kind. And I think, and I, think I just want to say that over and over again. That, that words are the vehicle of creation. I'll say that again. Words are the vehicle of creation, are the vehicles of creation, which means the words you speak creates after their kind. Which also means the words you hear creates after their kind. You hear the words of faith, it will create after their kind. You hear the words of fear. They will create after their kind because words are seeds planted in the ground of the heart or in the heart of your mind and will produce after their kind. That's just the way it is. The Bible says in the book of Mark chapter 4 that the kingdom of God is like a man should plant a seed in the ground and the man should go and sleep and wake up, sleep and wake up. He does not know how it happens. But one day the man wakes up, finds out how that the earth has produced of its own accord. The stem, the the corn, and the full corn in the hair. Which means he's saying, when you plant the seed in the ground, you don't know how it works. But one day, the earth, the, the, the earth we cause the seed planted to produce what? A plant, and the plant will produce fruit. And then you can reach out your hand and pick it up. But remember, he's using that as an analogy. He's using it as, as an analogy to teach you about the principle about the kingdom. That the kingdom functions the same way the plant that is the seed that's planted in the ground functions, whereby you don't know how the seed becomes a plant. But one day you wake up, go into your garden, find out that the seed has become a full blown plant and has fruit in there. And then you just go in there and reap the harvest. He's saying, when you plant the word of God as a seed in your heart. You don't know how it's going to work, but one day you're going to wake up, realize that the seeds that the seed of the word of God that you have planted in your heart will grow up as a plant to produce fruit in your life. Essentially, that word will produce after its kind. I hope you understand that. Okay, so now it's very important to therefore understand that, therefore, that your faith or your belief grows to the extent of what you hear about the good news about Jesus Christ. If you hear bad news, your faith cannot grow. Instead, fear will grow. Therefore, it's important to understand that to develop an ownership mindset or a mindset on ownership mentality, you must listen only to messages that teach you about the rulership that you have in Christ. You must listen to messages that teach you about your joint heirship with Jesus. If you listen to any sort of messages or what I call convoluted conversations, they will confuse you. They will confuse you. Let me tell you something. People of God, who you are in Christ, what Christ has made you, does not require you to prove yourself to anyone. I want you to write that down. What God has called you, 
what he has made you, what he has given to you, does not require you to prove yourself to anyone. In Psalm 8, verse 6, that we looked last week, the Bible says, God has made us a little lower than himself, and he has crowned us with glory and honor. That's verse 5. And in verse 6, it says that he has committed into our hands he has, all the things that God has created. He has put them under our feet, which means God has made us what? rulers over this earth. Psalm 105, that we look at last week, says, The heavens belong to God. The earth he has given to you, to the sons of men. So, therefore, if you hear a message that talks about the fact that you are an owner, you co-own with God, you are joined here with Christ, that you have this ownership mindset and you should develop one, you should ensure that you keep feeding your mind on it, it will produce that image after its kind in your life. But if you leave that kind of message and you go back and listen to a message that talks about, oh, you are nobody, you are a sinner saved by grace, nothing is working in your life, oh Lord, hold me, hold me, oh Lord, help me, oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord, you look at me, I'm a worm, what's going to happen? If that is all you then begin to listen to, then what's going to happen? You have confused your mind. You have contradicting messages going on in your mind. And your mind will not produce result as it is meant to produce. So, now that you've understood that, I want to say a couple of things. Number one, God already declared you his child. All you need to do is to believe him and walk in the consciousness of whom he has declared you to be. Believing God, believing who God requires as, as declared you to be, believing who he has made you, believing what he said you have, requires an act of faith. Now, remember, how does that faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. You don't hear once. You hear and hear and hear and hear until what you have heard has saturated your heart and built a new image there that's so to the point where you do what you then speak now. Because the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. So you, you hear and hear and hear and hear about the ownership mindset, about your identity in Christ, about what God has done for you, about who you are now, about who you are about what God has done for you in Christ, about what God calls you now. You hear and hear and hear and hear and hear and hear. The Bible says faith comes as you hear, not once. You keep hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. Faith comes as you hear this message, the good news about Jesus Christ. The faith will come. Now, the Bible says, now, when that faith comes, the Bible then says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will then speak. So now faith has come, your heart has been so riddled with what you have heard, so much so you have faith, then what happened? It will come out of your mouth. And when it comes out of your mouth, people of God, it will change your environment. Why? Because by through faith we believe. We understand that the words were framed by the word of God. The words were set in motion, set in shape by the word of God. The word that God spoke set things in motion. So as you speak now out of a heart that has been saturated with this new image and you begin to speak that out of your mouth, guess what you are doing? You are shaping your life. You are shaping your destiny. You are shaping everything around you. People of God, you have to put the word of God above your senses above the words of your friends and family. It's important for you to know that you cannot experience the life of God above the level of your belief. You cannot experience what God wants you to experience above the level of your belief. Your belief determines your experience in life. So how are beliefs formed? Beliefs is formed through repetitive information. Write that down. Beliefs are formed through repetitive, repetitive information that have not never been challenged. Whether it's true or not, whether information you've heard is true or not, when you listen to it over and over and over, it becomes a belief system. Your mind becomes set. It becomes a set mind. So, your heart believes what it is exposed to constantly. If you have spent your Christian life believing in lies, then you experience a life of lies, even though that's not what God intended for you to have. Proverbs 23 verse 7 says, as a man thinks in his heart, so easy. So, which means you will become what you predominantly think about. If you think yourself to be poor and helpless and useless, that's what you will become. If you think yourself to be strong, bold and courageous, that's also what you will become. So, thinking and believing yourself to be who God declared you to be is so crucial that I want to read to you a small story. I may have read this before. Is from a book called Walk Tall, You Are a Daughter of God by a lady called Jamie Glenn. I talked about an eagle 
we thought and believe it was a chicken. Now, I have this extract in my book, The Glory of Honor, Volume 1. You can go and get it on now. If you want, it's a devotional, the devotional that talks about your identity in Christ. Here's, here's, here's an extract. It says, A baby eagle became orphan when something happened to his parent. He glided down to the ground from his nest, but was not yet able to fly. A man picked him up. The man took him to a farmer and said, This is a special kind of banyan chicken that will grow up big. The farmer said, don't look like no banyan chicken to me. Oh, yes, it is. You'll be glad to own it. So, this man that picked up this chicken, this, this eagle, named the eagle a chicken. Remember, the eagle was young. The eagle, eagle cannot, does not know who, who, it, who it was. The eagle cannot challenge that conversation. The, yeah? And everybody goes around calling this eagle a banyan chicken. All right? So, the farmer took the baby eagle and placed it with his chickens. The baby eagle learned to imitate the chickens. He could scratch the ground for grubs and worms because he grew up thinking it was a chicken. One day, an eagle flew over the barnyard. The eagle looked up and wondered, what kind of animal is that? How graceful, how powerful, how free it is. Now, notice what's happening. The eagle resonated. The eagle on the ground resonated with the eagle in the sky. That's, his, that, that's, that's what I could be. That's what I could become. An owner. An owner of the sky. The eagle is the owner of the sky. I could be like that. You might be having this journey in your heart and say, "Life, my life is all to have to all to be more than it is. I ought to have more. I ought to be more. I ought to be to do more than what I am doing." Then this message is going to be a blessing to you because actually that yearning in your heart, that groaning in your heart that says, "I could be more. I could have more," is the calling of God upon your life. God is calling you to step out and be who He has called you to be. But people of God requires what a change in thinking. Now, when this eagle looked up and said, oh, how majestic, how great, how free, this, this other eagle looked. Nah, he made a mistake. He turned around and turned to another chicken. What is that? The chicken replied, oh, that is an eagle. But don't worry yourself about that. You will never be able to fly like that. That's the end of the story. The eagle here, the chicken here, retreated. The negative feedback that this ego has lived with all of his life and said, You will never be able to fly like that. The ego never challenged that thinking. Never thought, Oh man, I don't, I refuse to believe this. Unfortunately, the ego went back to scratching the ground. He continued to behave like the chicken he thought he was. Finally, he died, never knowing the grand life that could have been his. People have gone, What's the moral of the story? Moral of the story is, your identity in Christ is the single most important reality that you must understand. If you are in Christ, you must understand who God has called you, how he sees you, who you are now, what you have access to. If you don't, you will not have this ownership mindset that means you can take charge of territories that God has placed in your life. So, when God says in Psalm 8, that God has made us a little lower than himself. He, God is saying, you are a small God yourself. You are a small God with a small G. Or not this big God. And why did God make you a God? So that you can take charge of the environment where he has placed you under the rulership of God Almighty to bring glory to him and touch lives. And that is what it means to have an ownership mindset. So now, I want to show you the reason why, even though we have spoken about Romans 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, I want you to show you something that is important about the fact that that faith that is coming by the word of God, there are precursors to it. Things that must, things are like the environment that you must find yourself in to enable you to be able to, uh, to keep hearing this word of God, this, this, this word of the ownership mindset, this word about the Father, God has placed you here to rule and reign in life. Now, let's go back to Romans chapter 10 from verse 5 to 17. The Bible says in verse 5, For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on the law shall live by it. But the righteousness based on faith says the following, Don't say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring, bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss that is to bring Christ up from the dead as if we are saved by we had we had to be saved by our own efforts doing the impossible now the Bible says, what does he say what does he say what is he referring to what does he say what does he say what does the righteousness that is based on faith say 
the righteousness that is based on faith, the fact that God has made you righteous now, what that the fact that God has made you righteous has a language, speaks in a particular way. What does that thing say? How, what does it say? The Bible here say, it says, the word is near you, in your mother, in your heart. The word of faith will preach. God is saying, Remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But this faith that comes by hearing and hearing by the word is in your mouth and is in your heart. Who? Do you notice that? In order for you to have a set mind based on ownership mindset, it must be in your mouth. It must be in your heart. That's it. That is it. You must be in your mouth. It must be in your heart. Then you now began to give an example because if you acknowledge and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. It's talking about the, fact, the, the only way you became saved is you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth. But notice here, he says you confess with your mouth first, right? You confess with your mouth first and you believe in your heart. Question, how can you believe unless you hear? Let's go there. I'm going to show you now in a moment. He says, let's jump to verse, um, verse 11. The Bible says, for the scripture says, whoever believes in him, will not be disappointed. Verse 12. Actually, jump to verse 13. Verse 13 says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If there's anybody, if you whoever, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But now look at verse 14. But how will people call on him in whom they have not believed? How can they call on him they have no belief. You know, when they call on him, they will be saved. So, if you want to say, oh, Lord, I want to have an ownership mindset. I say, Father, Lord, help me to have an ownership mindset. You cannot pray that prayer unless you believe. Now, he now said, how will they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How can you believe when you have not heard? And how can they hear except there is a preacher? Or a messenger, somebody that tells them about it. And how can there be somebody who tells them about it, who preaches about this? Only that person has been sent for that purpose. The Bible says, it is written, and forever remains written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. The Bible essentially is saying a couple of things I want you to see. Somebody cannot preach about this thing that I'm preaching to you today. Unless God commissions them to preach it. Unless they have been sent to, to preach it. But what is this message? This message is a message of, of good news, of good things. So, a person who has been called to preach the gospel must first be called by God to preach the good news that will set his people free, that will cause them to fulfill their purpose and destiny, which is what I've been called to do. Yeah, there, a preacher has to be sent. And when a preacher speaks then people can hear when people hear they can believe when they believe they can call on god that is it so now you see why it is important therefore that the kind of preacher or the messenger that you are listening to is important because it says you cannot call on god to have an ownership mindset unless you believe you cannot believe god for an ownership mindset unless you are first of all here all of us, you have heard about it. You cannot hear beyond who you listen to or what you listen to regularly. And the person who speaks this to, to you can only preach such a message because that person has been called by God to do it. So, God wants you to listen to who? The people whose feet are beautiful because they bring good news of good things. The question I have got for you today is, are you hearing the good news? Will you go to church and you come out. Do you feel that you have had the good news? Do you feel like you have had the good news? What is good news? Good news is any message that focuses on the finished work of Jesus Christ. That focuses on the death, the burial, the resurrection, the death, the burial, resurrection, ascension of Jesus Christ. Every message that talks about Jesus and what he has done for us, what he has achieved for us, that is the good news. Question is, are you hearing the good news? Because the Bible says, those whose feet are beautiful will preach the good news of good things. They are the one you should listen to. These people, when you listen to them, what will happen? They will, you, they will preach the message you will hear. When you hear, you have to believe. 
when you believe you can call. So now you can see the pattern that when I said your mind can be framed by the word of God, it means what you hear constantly about the word of God, what you hear constantly will set your mind. So as you hear the good news about who God is, what Christ, what Christ has done for us, what Christ calls you now, the new name he has given to you, the fact that you don't have a past. If you, as you begin to hear all these things, what will happen here is you have to believe. It is when you believe then that you can speak. I hope that makes sense now. When you believe, you speak. Because when you believe, the way, the proof of your belief shows itself in the, in the way you speak. Do you understand what I'm saying? So now let's say, for example, you are here today. You have not believed about this ownership mindset. You, have, you don't even understand what it is. This is the first time you're hearing it. What do you need to do? You need to keep hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. But that faith, in order for you to keep hearing, 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 it must be something that you have heard first. You hear. You hear over and over and over because a messenger like myself or other people that are preaching the good news have spoken up to you about who you are in Christ and what God has done for you and your identity in Christ. You hear and hear and hear. As you hear these things, what will happen? It will cause a belief to rise up in you. Now, because remember, the word spoken will create in you the image of the word spoken. So if you hear about what God has called you, who has declared you to be over and over and over and over again, what will happen is that you will then have a mindset, a set mind that embraces your new identity in Christ. When you embrace that identity, it will come out in the what you say. So therefore to have a mindset, you need to hear what? Constantly what you want to become. Your mind is set to the extent of the image of the words you listen to continually. This is the unfailing law. It's the unfailing law. What you listen to will shape your belief. What you believe will become your reality. That is it, people of God. So that's why we focus a lot in this church. I talk a lot about the word, what you say, what you say. You know, my children, I talk about the... My, my, my first child told me one time, she said, Daddy, you've spoken about this, this thing so much. One time I had a dream and I saw your head in the dream. Your head was saying to me like this, Words are powerful. Words are powerful. Words are powerful. I busted out laughing. And I said, well, now if you start to dream about me saying that in your dream, that means it's getting to your subconscious mind. All right? So, I'm saying to you too, people of God, the words you speak, we that make or mind you. The Bible says, life and death and the power of the tongue. Those that love it will eat the fruit of it, whether for life or for death. So be careful what you say. Hallelujah. Now, let's continue. Now, I want to tell you a story. I cannot go into it properly here. I want to tell you a story. In Numbers chapter 13 to chapter 14, when you have your, you can write it down in your pen. But it's a story there that I want to talk to you about. The power of the mindset. The Bible talks about the story of 12 spies. God said to them, they should go to uh, the land of Canaan to go and check out the land. They were still in the wilderness, all right? God said to them, let them go check out the land and see how the land is. And they should bring forth fruit from the land. So that what? So that the, the, the people will know that the land that God has actually said he was going to give them is the land truly flowing with milk and honey. God doesn't need to prove himself, but he said, let them just, let them just go. They went there and they came back. They brought grapes. And they said, the land itself, the land actually was a great land, was a good land. Look at what we brought from it. And then they started to speak nonsense, right? They started to speak nonsense. I want to show you the nonsense they spoke uh, in verse number 13, verse um, 31. The man who had gone up with him said, with, there's a guy called Joshua, uh, Caleb, sorry. Caleb, actually, let me start from verse, uh, verse 28. I saw from verse 27. They reported to Moses and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It's, and it suddenly does flow with milk and honey, and this is the fruit. If they had stopped, they would have been better. But look at what they said. But the people who live in the land are strong, okay? And cities are fortified, okay? And very large, okay? Moreover, we saw there this, the descendants of Anak, people from of people of great stature and courage, okay? The people descended from Amalek, Amalek. The people, the people descended from Amalek live in the land of the Negev. The Hittite, the Jebusite, the Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaan live by the Dead Sea. Excuse me. And along the side of Jordan. Okay, they were just saying, they talked talk about the people that you saw there. Okay. So, Caleb got a, got a drift of where these guys are going. 
Caleb quieted, quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession of it, for we certainly conquer it. So Caleb started speaking the way God wants you to speak when you face a situation. Let's just go and let's go and take it. Let's go and take it. Let's go and take it because God has given given us land. Let's go and take it. That was what Caleb was saying. But the men who had gone up with him said, "We are not able to go. We are not able to go up against these people of Canaan, for they are too strong for us." Now they have started speaking negatively. Say these people are too strong for us. Now, Pastor Jesus says they gave the Israelites a bad report about the land which they aspired as saying, "The land through which we went." In spying it out is a land that divorces its inhabitant. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, part of the Nephilim, and we were like grasshopper in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Now listen to what they are saying. The Bible says they gave the Israelites the bad report. Now think about it. There were about maybe 3 million, 4 million in the camp. They were waiting eagerly. Ha! Ah, God has made this promise to us. We're going to get into this land with make and honey. Some of them may have dreamt about the land. They have, may have, imagine husband and wife holding hands in the, in the camp in the night and walking around and saying, ah, man, this pilgrimage will be over one day. Baby, when we get into our land, I'm going to buy you a beautiful gown. I'm going to manicure the garden. Imagine, they were, doing, they were having this conversation in their heart, right? And now, God said, send men to go to that land and go and see whether that land really is what I've said. And they came back and said, oh, that land is indeed a wonderful land. Yeah, wonderful land. Imagine you are the husband who has just spent some, some evenings with your wife walking around the camp and painted this beautiful picture of hope of how the future will look like. When that message came, you are happy, right? Oh, God has not lied to us. But then they began to say, they began to say, the land that we have just spoken to you that it has this beautiful thing devours its people. <laughs> this land, when you get in there, even though there's good things, it's going to kill you. In fact, when we look at ourselves, we were like grasshopper in our own side. We look at it, we were tiny puny grasshopper compared to these people that are so great and giant. The Bible says their report was by report. He, he painted fear in the heart of people, in the heart of people. Now remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, but fear also comes by hearing and hearing the word of the devil. All right. Now look at what verse 14 then says. God says to them, in chapter 14. Chapter 14. I'm good. Chapter 14. Let me show you what happens. God says. But so chapter 14, after they've said this, go see what happened. They all the congregation. Now, when the Bible used the odd word all, it means all. And when everybody there began to cry. The Bible says they raised out their voices and cried out, and people wept that night. They three million people wailed throughout the night because of the negative conversation of ten people. Ten people. Ten people. And they began to speak. Oh, that we had died in the land of Egypt. Or that we had died in the wilderness. Why is the law bringing us to this land of Canaan to fall by the sword? Our wives and children will become plunder. Will it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to another, let us appoint a new leader and return to Egypt. Anyway, that's I don't want to go into the, the, the whole story. But the key thing I want to say to you here is these people had a mindset of a slave. Why is it that every single time they run into a small challenge, they want to go back to where they left? The answer is, they were born into slavery. Of, of all those congregations that were there, not one of them has experienced freedom, living as a freeborn. For 400 years, they were born into slavery. All they knew in their lives was slavery, was serving the Egyptians. So anytime they face a, a paradigm shift, don't that take them in a new direction. That thing might look like to stretch them a bit. They want to run back to what they are comfortable with or to what they have always known. They want to run back there because that is the way a mindset is formed. A mindset becomes what? Becomes a strong gold in your life. It doesn't allow you to move forward. When you do something new, the mindset pulls you back. But praise God, praise God that God has not left us to the prey of our mindset. He has brought us into a new dimension. He has said we can change our own lives. You know, in the book of Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 3, the Bible talks about the fact that these people that mourn and groan and wept throughout the night that said that they want to go back to Egypt, God actually said to them, 
of all, all of them, they will not get into Kenya. They did not enter into the promised land. But their children are the ones that go made to enter into the promised land. So for 40 years, they were in the wilderness and they all died in the wilderness. What does that mean? It means that they did not possess the land that God had in intention for them. How is this possible? Because they listen to the negative voice of their leaders. They listen to the negative voice that says they cannot have what God says they can have. They are not who God says they are. They saw themselves as grasshoppers instead of giant, bold, people that God has declared them to be. You see what I'm saying now? You see, therefore, that the words that were spoken by those 10 spies painted the image of what the spies said into the heart of all of the congregation to the point where they became the image that was painted in their heart. What was that image? The image that the land devours the people, which means they saw the picture of death from the words that the spies were speaking. They internalized this image of dying. They vocalized it out of their mouth and therefore that's what they got. All of them died in the wilderness. They didn't go to Canaan to die but ultimately they still died in the wilderness. Why? Because they have embraced an image. They have had a mindset that says they are going to die. God said, as you have spoken in my ears, so it will be done to you. So you are under the new covenant. You are made to operate under what? A higher realm. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1 says, Let us also fear, lest a promise left of us entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. God says, I have given you an ownership mindset. I don't want you to come short of it. Why? Verse 2 says, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2 says, For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. Why? Because it was not mixed with faith in them that heard it. The Bible here is essentially saying, when we preach a message like this, about the fact that you have an ownership mindset, about the fact that God has made you the head and not the tail, about the fact that you are a joint heir with Christ, about the fact that you are not a slave, about the fact that God has desired and has moved abundance into your life. When we preach a message like this, that you are meant to operate under a different realm, a different culture, when we preach a message like this, that you are not meant to conform yourself to the image of this world, to the thinking of this world, to the way this world works, and you refuse to believe it. The Bible says there is a danger in there that the same way the gospel was preached to the, or the, these people of old and they did not benefit the, in the gospel, is the same way that it can happen if you don't believe that we don't enjoy the benefit of the gospel. Because the Bible says that it they did not enjoy it because they did not mix with faith in them that had it. What does faith? Faith comes again by hearing and hearing and hearing. So I'm saying to you, what you hear and who you hear from matters. If you constantly hear the message of fear, it will produce fear in your life. If you constantly hear the message of life, it will produce life in your life. Now, the choice is yours. The choice is yours. What are you going to hear? What are you going to say? What are you going to say? Listen, I want to, I want to retreat this until it sinks into your heart. You cannot have faith beyond what you listen to. You cannot have faith beyond what you listen to. Who you listen to matters. What you listen to matters. Don't listen to conversation or messages that build fear in your heart. If you listen to that information, it will create that same image in your heart and it will produce after their kind. What paint pictures, people of God? What paint pictures in your heart? Either success images or failure images. So every single time you hear you hear words, every single time you internalize words, they paint pictures in your heart. Now that's what happened to these these guys when they came back. The spies came back with the word of the the, the land devours the people. The sons of Anak were there, were like grasshopper in our own side. When they came with those words, those words paint pictures of fear of hopelessness in the heart of people. Guess what happened? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Guess what happened? They began to speak. Now, here's the thing. Every time you speak words, the words change the atmosphere around you, change the atmosphere around the people around you, and then it will either make you to act in fear or in faith. So, the words you speak can change your life. How do you know where you're getting? Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. It goes into your heart. Put a picture in there. The heart is filled with that picture. It has to come out of your mouth. When you speak it out of your mouth, guess what happened? You are releasing into the atmosphere, powerful frequency that can change everything around you 
that can change your life, that can change the lives of your children, that can change your finances. That's the reason why we do affirmation so much. Some people think affirmation is just okay, 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 conversation. No, it is not. Listen to me. Affirmation will change your life. Just do it repeatedly over and over. In the beginning, you might not really see the value. You might not see the change. Just keep doing it. You didn't get to the same kind of mindset overnight, right? Remember, mindset is a set mind that is exposed to certain information over time that never got challenged. So as you exchange the mindset of the world to the mindset of God, it, it takes time. It, it takes time. You change one, you move on, you put another one there. So the message that Christ has for you today is this. All things are yours. So how do you develop an ownership mindset? Number one, hear messages that speak about this ownership mindset over and over and over and over. Messages that speak about your identity in Christ, who God is to you, who you are now in Christ, what God has declared you to be, the name that God has given you, appellation that you now have, what you have in Christ, your headship in Christ. Listen to that over and over and over. This was that you hear. Remember, we paint pictures in your heart. So the pictures in your heart now, I want you to do what? Meditate on it. Imagine yourself living the life of someone who owns all things. In your imagination and through meditation, let your heart paint pictures over and over as somebody who has an ownership mindset, which means when, they, when you are looking for work, when you are looking for work, give an example, and they said to you, there's no job in the market. Never ever see that there's no job in the market. Go into your mind and see yourself having multiple jobs, multiple streams of income. But it's not going to happen overnight, people of God. You keep hearing. You allow your heart to paint these new pictures. Because every single time you paint these new pictures in your heart, you are defining a new boundaries. You are defining a new frame for you to live in. Even though that frame is in the realm of the spiritual, you can't see physically, but you are defining the boundaries of your new reality by the imagination of your heart. All right. After you've done that, the Bible says, out of the, the abundance of the heart, what happens? The mouth will speak, right? Then begin to speak like someone who owns all things. Amen. Begin to speak like someone who owns, owns, owns all things. Now, as you begin to speak like someone who owns all things, you know what's going to happen? You are then going to begin to act like someone who owns all things. Why is that? What we speak changes us. What we speak impacts us so powerfully more than we know. So, as you do this, the Lord will begin to then make you to, as you act, you are now acting in synchrony with what you speak with what you have believed in your heart, with what you are, you keep hearing. After a while, life just becomes so seamless for you. I don't know if that, that, is, that has been wonderful for you. See, all things are yours. All things are yours. Let's go back to the text. All things are yours as I, ran, as I round up. As I round up. Praise God. The Bible here says, Therefore, let no man boast in me. Don't say, I know so, so, and so. I know so, so, and so. Don't put your, your hope on someone. Don't put your identity on someone. The, the people that you know, as that's what gives you self-worth. No, the Bible says, for all things are yours. Whether it's Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the word of life or death or the present or the future, all things are already yours. Do you believe that all things are yours? Do you believe that all things are yours? Let us bow down our heads as we pray. Almighty God, I thank you. Thank you, Almighty God, that you thought of this morning that all things are ours. That we need to hear, keep hearing about this message. We need to imagine it and believe it in our heart. We need to speak it out of our mouth. We need to act it out in our lives. This is how we develop an ownership mindset. And I want to thank you for your people that this day, oh Lord, as they live here, they will put this into use in the name of Jesus Christ. Your word says, blessed are those who are the doers of the world. That the doers of the world are the ones who are blessed indeed. I thank you, Almighty God, as we do these things, we will receive the benefit of doing them. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, we pray. Now, I want to pray for someone today. You are here. You have never made the, the Lord Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. So today is an opportunity for you to give your life to Jesus. I'm just going to be running up in two minutes. And so, remember that Romans chapter 10 that we read earlier. The Bible says, with a heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mass confession is made unto salvation, which means you have to hear the message about the good news of Jesus. You have to believe in your heart, and then you have to speak it out of your mouth. All right. So if you want to do that, you want to, you want to make an end of all, the, all this running around in circle, you want to come into this family of God and become a child of God, today I'm going to give you an opportunity to give your life to Jesus. Now say with me, Father, in the name of Jesus, I believe that Jesus died for me and died as me. I believe he paid the price for my sin. 
Father, I give my life to Jesus. Jesus, receive me as I am. Thank you for having me. From today, I believe I'm a child of God. And I confess with my mouth that I'm a child of God. Thank you, for, thank you Jesus, for saving me. In Jesus' name, we pray. Now, if you say that with your, with your mouth, I believe that I sin in your heart. The Bible says, you are now a child of God. Praise God for everyone. Now, what will you need to do? If you can write to the church, light at the lighthouse.org, we will send you, I will send you a book, my devotional, Glory and Honor, for free. It will be a, 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 a book that teaches you about your identity in Christ, at, the, at least at the beginning level, so that you can begin to internalize this and know that you are not a child of God. You are no longer a servant or slave of sin, but a child of God. Until next time, remember, you are blessed and highly favored.